Up next in the broadcast poll show, voters shifting towards the opposition party or independents for next week's local elections as public sentiment still stings from last month's ferry sinking disaster. A lower economic outlook this year for the Korean economy from a state-run policy think tank citing lower private consumption. And over in Ukraine, after a clash between rebels and government forces at the airport in the city of Donetsk, insurgents claim at least 30 of their own are dead. Primetime News begins now. Hello and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Kang Tae-ri. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sean Lim. We begin with the latest in the political headwinds taking us to next week's local elections. And polls show Korea's ruling party is facing an uphill battle in the face of public anger over the government's poor handling of the April ferry disaster. Opposition candidates are in the lead in six key races, even including a traditional conservative stronghold. Chi myung gil has more on how far ahead non-ruling party candidates are getting. Candidates of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy, or NPAD, and independent candidates are still out in front of their Senuri party rivals in six of seven key battlegrounds in the June 4th local elections. That includes the races for mayor in the cities of Seoul and Incheon and for governor in the Gangwon-do and Chungcheong-bukdo provinces. An opinion poll conducted by Matrix has the incumbent mayor of Seoul, Park won sun with a comfortable lead over his conservative rival, Chung mong jun While in the race for Gyeonggi-do governor, the opposition candidate Kim Jin-pyo has made up ground against the ruling party's Nam kyung pil and now leads by 0.2 percentage points. The most surprising turn of events may just come from Busan. The ruling party has held a firm grip on the position of mayor in the southern port city for decades, but the recent polls show independent candidate Oh go Don with a comfortable lead over this Henry party candidate. With just over a week until election day, the ruling party candidate is in the lead in just one of the seven key races, that being for mayor of the administrative city of Sejong, where Henry candidate Yu Han Sik is up against his MPAD rival. Korea's local election results are considered a barometer of public sentiment for the ruling party and their government, which has borne the brunt of criticism in recent weeks over its handling of the April ferry disaster that left more than 300 people dead. Jim young gil Arirang News. Turning now to the latest in the search for those believed responsible for the April ferry disaster, Korea's Justice Ministry says Interpol has arrested a daughter of Yu byung un the fugitive owner of the sunken Seoul Ho ferry. She was at a Paris apartment when she was taken into custody on Tuesday after prosecutors invalidated her passport and put her on Interpol's wanted list. Yu's daughter had refused several summons for questioning and faces allegations of embezzlement. She'll return to Korea after going through extradition proceedings. However, the search continues for Yu byung un and his other children, who are also believed to be on the run. Speaking of her recently pledged government reforms in the aftermath of the Seoul disaster, President Bakane proposes a new deputy prime minister to look after education, social and cultural issues while the security ministry gets a revamp. Our Che Yusun has more. President Bak says there should be a new deputy prime minister in charge of policy making on non economic issues related to education, social, and cultural affairs. At a cabinet meeting Tuesday, the president said the current deputy and finance minister will continue to look after economic policies, while the head of the National Security Office handles Korea's foreign, defense, and security issues. She then said the new deputy should be given the task of overseeing the remaining issues mainly related to education, society and culture, something the president says is needed to increase efficiency and responsibility in policy making. Meanwhile, the education minister is expected to take on the role of the new deputy. Officials at the presidential office say the Troika system, with the prime minister in charge of law and order, public sector reforms and public safety alongside the two deputies, reflects the president transferring more responsibilities to the executive branch. 
The top office added that the Ministry of Security and Public Administration, which came under fire for its lax response to the recent ferry accident, will be renamed and its safety and personnel management roles removed. The ministry, however, will retain its tasks of managing government structure and other administrative affairs. Its current safety management responsibility will be transferred to the new safety ministry and personnel management to the new personnel ministry, both under the prime minister's office. The presidential office is expected to unveil a more detailed government restructuring plan on Wednesday, which it hopes passes parliament as soon as possible. Che Yusun, Arirang News. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has called for revived dialogue in order to deal with North Korea's nuclear problem. Speaking at the Chinese embassy on Tuesday during his two-day visit to South Korea, Wang emphasized the need for combined efforts by neighboring countries to restart the six-party denuclearization talks. And despite diplomatic efforts to jumpstart the long-stalled six-party nuclear talks, North Korea may not be willing to negotiate with its nuclear program under any circumstances. Our Hwang Sung Yi sat down with Dr. Victor Cha, Korea Chair for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, for his view on the prospect of denuclearization dialogue. Bringing back North Korea to the negotiating table could take some time. In an interview with Arirang News on Tuesday, Victor Cha, Korea Chair for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, said the United States has shown some flexibility, but that its offer remains unanswered. But I think what the United States is saying is that, look, if you show you're willing to stop testing and r allow inspectors back in, then the U.S. is willing to come back to negotiations. It's a sign of flexibility on the part of the United States to keep the negotiations alive. Uh, but the North Koreans don't seem to be interested in that right now. While some view the so-called six-party talks as an old formula, the visiting expert said the multilateral framework is still a valid way to denuclearize Pyongyang. The six-party talks involving the two Koreas, the United States, China, Japan and Russia, broke down in December 2008. The U.S.-North Korea bilateral is important because North Korea wants to talk to the United States. But the six-party format is also important because it ensures that uh, whatever agreements are made between the U.S. and North Korea are reaffirmed in the six-party context to ensure that, uh, in particular, the North Koreans comply with the agreements. Dr. Cha says China could take a stronger role by linking North Korea's economic aid to its denuclearization, but that it's not ready to take that risk. If they cut off things too severely, they could collapse the regime. And right now, at least their calculation is that that is not worth mm -hmm. the risk, uh, even though it means a slowly developing nuclear program. And the remaining five parties have problems of their own. For instance, South Korea and Japan are at odds over historical issues. Dr. Cha says the friction will affect the ability to coordinate effectively on North Korea, which is why the two neighbors both need to take action. Uh, I certainly think that Japan should issue an apology for the comfort women. Uh, but if the Japanese issue an apology, I think the South Koreans have to be ready to accept an apology. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chae Ri from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Korea's state-run economic policy think tank has lowered its economic outlook for this year to 3.7 percent. As our Kwon Suwa reports, last month's ferry disaster played a key role in this revision. A drop in private consumption is the main culprit that brought down the Korea Development Institute's growth forecast this year. This comes as consumers have been spending less since the Sewolho ferry disaster last month. Although the think tank did not see this as a long-term risk, the slow consumption pulled down the country's 2014 economic growth forecast to 3.7 percent. Number-wise, it's the same figure from its last projection. 
But given its recent adjustment in its GDP calculation, this reflects a drop of 0.2 percent. Not only dull consumption, but also growth forecasts in facility investment and spending in the construction were revised down. And against this backdrop, the KDI added that the country needs to allow a slight fiscal deficit for now, given the consumption slowdown, and called on the Bank of Korea to hold the key rate, saying it may be too premature to tighten the money flow. And it looks like worries over the ferry disaster's impact on domestic spending are resonating in the central bank as well. The May minutes from the Bank of Korea show some committee members did raise views that the ferry disaster may crimp spending and investment in the country. Kwon so Arirang News. A prominent trend in the Korean society these days is that more women in their 30s continue on with their careers. Fresh data shows their presence in the workforce reached a record high last year. Shin Semin tells us more. More Korean women are jumping in the workforce. The labor participation rate of women in their 30s hit its highest rate on record last year, albeit with minor growth. According to Statistics Korea, the percentage of women between the ages of 30 and 39 with jobs was 57 percent in 2013. The numbers in the age bracket have been growing, but only by about one percentage point each year since 2009, with the exception of 2008 when the global financial crisis hit. Experts mainly attribute the growth of women in the workforce to more women receiving higher education and putting off marriage. While the labor participation rate has been on a steady rise, Korea still lags far behind when compared to other countries. Among the OECD nations, Korea is one of the countries on the bottom of the list when it comes to the female labor participation rate. For instance, in 2012, the OECD average was in the low 70 percent range, while Korea was in the 50 percent range. And while government measures such as encouraging companies to provide more flexible working hours for women have helped raise the participation rate of Korean women, Kang added that the private sector needed to do more. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Korea's main gateway, Incheon International Airport, has ranked the world's best airport for nearly a decade now. But it is falling short in one area, its goal of becoming a so-called hub airport. Fewer international travelers are passing through Incheon on their way to other stops. Connie Kim has the details. Their concerns Incheon International Airport may lose its reputation as a regional aviation hub. The number of passengers making international transfers at Korea's largest airport has been on the decline in recent months. In April, 525,000 people stopped over in Korea on their way to other destinations, a significant drop from just eight months earlier. It's a disconcerting trend for an airport like Incheon that aspires to be a so-called hub airport. Compared to others that boast that title like Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, Germany's Frankfurt Airport and Singapore Chani Airport, Incheon lags far behind with a transfer rate at 17 percent this year, placing it outside the global top 10. The Korean daily Joseonilbo attributes the decline to fewer Japanese and Chinese passengers passing through the airport. Experts say Incheon International Airport needs to increase the supply of international flight transfers in order to increase its transfer passengers. Hong Kong and Singapore have risen as hub airports because of convenient business travel schedules and low air freight charges. Korea needs to actively bring in more diverse airlines from abroad to increase supply to passengers. Lee also added that establishing tourist attractions would also help. Although Incheon International Airport has topped the airport service quality assessment for nine consecutive years, it has a number of hurdles to scale before it can call itself one of the world's hub airports. Connie Kim, Arirang News, Incheon. Shares of Taum Communications soared by the daily limit of 15 percent today on the Cosby in an apparent reaction to its announcement of uh, merger plans with Kakao. And uh, for more on this, we're uh, joined by Professor Moon Song Chan in the studio. So, uh, Professor, how optimistic are you? Is this going to be a big enough of a threat to Naver? The, uh, this deal is a kind of desperate an inevitable choice for both companies because they recorded uh, loss in revenue. Uh, 
uh, for three consecutive years in a row. Mm. So to show this strength, the, I guess the idea is to use the mobile traffic on Kakao Talk mm -hmm. and then pair that with Tom's internet search function, webtoons, and ads. Mm -hmm. How is the how is this going to be the most effective in terms of uh, bringing these two companies together? What route should they take? I, I think they should show the profit. You know, otherwise the customer will turn away. You know, uh, and uh, the the they could uh, be collapsed in a year or two. And I think the the they should have some focus. Uh, as a uh, you know uh, future strategy, uh, I think the, they could aim for uh, maybe kind of uh, the telecom service provider. So I, I mean, I mean another so telecom service provider in Korea, other than SK Telecom and KT and LG U Plus. So uh, we, as a customer, are waiting for another challenger in telecommunications service provider sector, you know. But uh, the, nobody is ready to take it. So Taum, even though it's the number two uh, internet portal and Kakao, the most popular messaging mm -hmm. app, it, it's very hard for these companies to make money, it seems. And, and you seem to think that one of their next growth points could be, um, be taking on some of the big yeah. mobile carriers, yeah. but what yeah. other areas do you think they should focus on? The, I think in terms of uh, the internet portal, the down is number two, but it is uh, not really number two. It is far behind uh, than neighbor. And uh, neighbor, you, you know, even neighbor still has to do a lot of things in terms of uh, technology and, and performance. Because we, when we compare the, the neighbor to Google, the Google is much dominant, uh, very much dominant in, in the world. And uh, the, the presence of neighbor and down in global world is rare. So how well do you think these two can retain consumers' uh, attention or interest in overseas markets? Because that's what uh, everyone's been asking since yesterday's announcement. Yeah, but uh, the in overseas market, uh, even the neighbor is very weak uh, because of the, the language barrier. Well, we've seen Facebook acquire WhatsApp, another messaging service, and then Rakuten buying Viber, another messaging mm -hmm. service. Uh, what's with this trend of these mega deals where messaging apps are the stars? So mega deal will happen more in the future because the, with only messaging services, it is not profitable. And, but the, the messaging service company has a lot of customers. That's their advantage. So uh, the, some other software company and internet portal and hardware company can acquire the messaging service company only because of the number of customers. And uh, they can use uh, that as a leverage to uh, change, uh, to challenge some other business. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and insight tonight. Thanks, indeed. The Ukrainian government has launched a military operation after pro-Russian rebels seized control of a major airport in the eastern part of the country. With more on that, we now turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, these rebel groups have been taking even bolder steps to gain independence, but it appears the government isn't letting them take another inch. And that's right. Kiev's response was swift and direct. The Ukrainian army sent in troops and issued an ultimatum to the separatist forces to lay down their arms following reports that the international airport in the city of Donetsk had been taken over. Clashes between soldiers and pro-Russian militia broke out on Monday, with the sounds of automatic weapons and rockets coming from inside the airport compound. Ukrainian helicopters and fighter jets were also seen firing at the concrete terminals and runways. After several hours, government forces finally managed to recapture the complex, forcing the local fighters to evacuate. Insurgents said at least 30 rebels were killed and their bodies taken to a nearby hospital a day after the heavy fighting. However, the mayor of Donetsk said the death toll had since risen to 40, with 31 injured as of Tuesday morning. 
Meanwhile, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has called on Kiev to stop the bloodshed with the immediate halt of military action. Lavrov added that Moscow was ready for direct talks with Petro Poroshenko, Ukraine's newly elected president. And moving on to India, the country has sworn in its new prime minister, Narendra Modi, after a sweeping election victory earlier this month. He was inaugurated as India's new leader in a ceremony on Monday with nearly 4,000 guests, including all South Asian heads of state. Modi becomes India's 15th prime minister with an outright majority in parliament, a first for the country in the past 30 years. Following the ceremony, Mo Modi met his Pakistani counterpart, Nawaz Sharif, in an effort to rebuild diplomatic and economic ties between the bitter rivals. The surprise move has raised hope for a thaw in relations between the nuclear armed neighbors. The Malaysian government has released satellite data used in the search for flight MH370, which disappeared nearly three months ago. There's been mounting calls from the relatives of the lost passengers for greater transparency in the ongoing search, which is now focused on finding debris using underwater robots. Malaysia's government and British satellite firm Inmarsat released the raw data on Tuesday that was used to determine the path of the missing Malaysia Airlines flight. This includes communication logs of seven so-called handshakes or pairs of numbers between the aircraft and satellite. Investigators believe the plane went down in the southern Indian Ocean off the western coast of Australia. Officials say it could take up to a year to search the 60,000 square kilometer area with questions being raised about how to proceed and how to split the growing search costs. That wraps up a look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. The World Cup is just over 15 days away and countries are busy making final preparations. That of course includes South Korea, which will face Tunisia in a tune-up match on Wednesday. It's a chance for manager Hong Myung-bo to gain vital information about his team, but he says that staying injury-free is of the utmost importance. He'll make adjustments on personnel and strategy, especially on the defensive side, which has been somewhat lacking. Meanwhile, Tunisia's coach, Georges Alikens, said that it was an honor for Tunisia and expressed hope his side would make it a good game. South Korea takes on Tunisia on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Korea time at Seoul World Cup Stadium. And over to the MLB, Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Lee Hyun Jin almost threw a perfect game in his team's 4-3 win over the Cincinnati Reds on Tuesday in L.A. In his attempt to follow Josh Beckett's no-hitter a day before, Ryu took the perfect game until the eighth inning when the Reds' Todd Frazier finally got a hit. He was tagged for three runs before being pulled with just one out recorded. The 27-year-old lefty has now won five games in nine starts this season. And coming back home, it's Tuesday's top KBO matchup. The Tucson Bears took a road trip to Gwangju to face the Kia Tigers. Now we go to the top of the first inning. Tucson's Hong Song Eun. He doubles and gets the first run in, but Kia responds in the third. Lee Dae Hyung starts the three run rally. It's 3 1 Tigers. Now to the fifth. More Kia bases loaded. Naji Wan brings two home with his hit. Tack on one more. It's 6 to 1. But Tucson's Kim Jae Hwan, he hits a two run shot in the eighth. And Tucson makes a small run, but Kia holds on to win this one, 8 to 5. And looking at the other games, we have NC dominating Hanwha 18 to 9. Nexon beats SK 10 to 5. Meanwhile, LG uh, breaks Samsung's winning streak at 11, winning this game 5 to 4. Well, that's all I have for now. This has been Stephen Chen. I'll see you back here later for more from the world of sports. Well, unwanted toxic dust from China continues to stick around today. Oh, well, I'm not a big fan of that. So now we are going to go to the Weather Center for more information. Po Gyeong is joining us. So, Po Gyeong, how much fine dust are we looking at? Hey guys, higher than normal levels of fine dust are being measured across the nation. At the moment, Seoul is seeing 187 micrograms per cubic meter of fine dust, which is about 
four times the normal levels. Gwangju is getting about 215 micrograms and Daegu 146 micrograms. So those with respiratory problems should refrain from doing outdoor activities. In terms of the weather, bright and sunny conditions are forecast throughout the weekend. Daytime high should once again hit 30 degrees on Friday. The nation is under the influence of a high pressure front from waters south of Jeju, which is why we're seeing clear skies across the map. Tomorrow afternoon, light passing sporadic showers are forecast for areas in the southern regions, but total precipitation should reach between 1 to 4 millimeters, so it won't be much. On to Wednesday's readings. Seoul, Daegu, and Gwangju make it to 28 degrees, while Busan hits 24. Moving on to other places, Jeju reaches 26 degrees, Tokdo and Mount Kumgang peak at 20 and 19. That's all the updates we're following at this hour, but tune in for more after midnight. Bo Kyung, thank you very much uh, as always. And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching. And I'll be back at midnight for Late Night Edition. See you then.